G'day, Malcolm. How are you, mate? I'm very well, thanks, Marcus. How are you? Well, um, I don't have a $5,000 Cartier watch, do you? No, I don't, and I'll never buy one. But, uh, you know, that's not the issue, really, at Australia Post. That's what you're talking about. What is the issue, Malcolm? I mean, uh, the whole thing, in my mind, has really be- become a-, a gender thing, which is a concern to me. Um, Christine Holgate, by all accounts, seems to be a pretty good operator. Has she been unfairly punished here, do you think? Definitely. There's no doubt about that, Marcus. She did a remarkable job. She turned that uh, Australia Post around from a big loss into a quite a substantial profit. Um, and what surprised us, we were about to start holding the government accountable about these um, Cartier watches. Yeah. But we noticed that Angela Cramp, and the, she's, she's head of the licensed post office operators, you know, not all, Tel- not all Australia Post, post offices are owned by Tel- uh, post office. They're, they're licensed out to the licensed post office uh, representatives. And Franchisees. Angela Cramp, Franchised. That's it. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. So Angela Cramp jumped in strongly to support that. And we thought, hang on, what's going on here? Because we've worked very closely with the licensed post office operators. And, um, and they've been really hard hit by, by Australia Post. What we found out was that Christine Holgate, when I held her accountable in Senate Estimates when she first came on board, she actually took note of what I said. And she followed up with Australia Post licensed post office operators and she helped them and started sorting out their problems. First time a long, in a long, long time these guys have had any support. So they jumped in and supported Holgate. That alerted us because we knew that, that the LPOs weren't, weren't in favour of the Australia Post executives normally. And so then Pauline and I both spoke with Holgate separately and then Pauline got the inquiry up in what's going on now after negotiating successfully with Labor, Greens and all the crossbenchers. You just cannot treat people this way. I believe the Prime Minister is not telling the truth. Holgate is telling the truth. Holgate's very confident. There are other issues here driving this. The Prime Minister should apologise at the very least. And some of the statements from Australia Post, the Chairman of Australia Post and the Ministers just don't add up. And I think the Prime Minister, if this keeps going the way it is, should resign. Because, and, and you know, at the very least... Marcus, he must apologise. He must apologise. Well, he, and he doesn't know how doesn't to. Apologize. Well, he doesn't know how to say the word sorry, Malcolm. We know that he doesn't uh, take any responsibility for his for his actions. He likes to obfuscate. He likes to lay the blame elsewhere. He got fairly close yesterday by saying that he regrets any hurt that Miss Holgate may well have felt, but he he's certainly not apologising. Yeah, exactly. And and, and look. What does this say about the taxpayer-funded empathy training? It's going to be a complete waste of time, the empathy training that the Liberal and Nats are going on. And what a lot of rubbish. All right. Now, the vaccination rollout. Boy, oh, boy. Uh, You say it's falling apart, mate. It is. There's a critical thing here that the government has forgotten. It's called informed consent. Before someone puts anything in my body, they need to get my consent. consent. Now... The vaccine, there are two vaccines out there at the moment, the AstraZeneca and the Pfizer one. We were told by the chief health officer that no one would know what vaccine was being distributed at which outlet because they didn't want people to come up and have a choice about the vaccine. I want this vaccine. I want that vaccine. That is completely unethical in my view. That's the first thing. The second thing is that They have rushed these vaccines, both of them. They both have serious questions about them. Both um, have bypassed some of the the details in the the testing procedures. The testing procedures have been accelerated, and now we've got problems. So um, it's the process here. The problem is the way the vaccine has been introduced before proper trials. There's a lack of data, and there's there's a lack of clear aims. And, And even the Minister for Health now, Greg Hunt, has admitted that even with the vaccine, it won't stop the restrictions. So what's the point? Fair enough. All right, now, you've been out and about. You've been uh, in western Queensland, well, north and western Queensland. You've been to Townsville, Charters Towers, Hewenden, Richmond, Julia Creek, Clon- uh, Cloncurry. Uh, you're in Mount Isa as well. You've been looking at water infrastructure and potential for agriculture up there. Yes, and, and Marcus, what an amazing place this is. It's, it's untapped, really. Um, big skies, big horizons, rich soil, plenty of sunlight, regular rain, and that's what surprised us, Yeah, the regular rain up here. Now, Richmond, and, and what's really stunning up here is that the, the local councils, the Shire councils, have 
got off their backsides and started to stimulate uh, thinking about irrigation projects because they can turn this black soil and sunlight mm. into bountiful production. Richmond has now got a, the, the Shire of Richmond, led yeah. by John Wharton, has got a project that will cost a total of $210 million, tiny, my, town, a tiny amount of money. 8,000 hectares of irrigated land will come out of it. No dam, no dam whatsoever, just a, 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 a diversion channel off flood seasons. Because the surprising thing is the rainfall is huge, but it comes at very short intervals and, and, and it's very regular. So they can mm. basically get a diversion, cha- diversion channel, take the flood water, harvest it across the floodplains. So you've got no environmental impact of a dam. And this whole area is buzzing, but what it needs is, is a government will to actually get off their backsides and do it. The state government is holding things back at the moment, okay. and the federal government is, is a bit lost. There, there seems to be a lack of vision in this country. Well, I mean, look at the Murray-Darling Basin. I mean, that's been a complete and utter schmozzle. You would have thought lessons have been learnt, mate. Well, you know, that's really interesting. We've got the Murray-Darling Basin has been decimated by the turnbull howard Water Act of 2007, which brought in the Murray-Darling Basin Authority. And it's interesting. They changed from a highly successful Murray-Darling Basin Commission in 2007 to the Murray-Darling Basin Authority. That tells you what it's about. The primary aims of the Murray-Darling Basin, oh, sorry, of the Water Act in 2007, yeah. included the compliance with international agreements. What the hell are we doing that for in our country? So they've made a mess of the Murray-Darling Basin. And, and it's, it's helped the corporates, destroyed farming communities, destroyed family farms. And we've actually got people up here now with a ton of energy from the, from the northern New South Wales area of the Murray-Darling Basin, and they're making a go of things up here and just getting in, rolling up their sleeves and tearing into it. They're, they're doing a wonderful job. Good to hear, Malcolm, and great to have you on the program as, as always. We'll talk again next week. Thank you very much, Marcus. Have a good week, mate. My pleasure. You too, mate. There he is, One Nation Senator Malcolm Roberts. Somebody sent me a note yesterday, Marcus. Why? Just why, oh, why do you speak to people like Malcolm and Pauline and, and also Mark Latham? Well, Malcolm Roberts just explained it perfectly this morning. I mean, he and Pauline Hanson spoke to Christine Holgate initially when she took on the job at Australia Post and she took their advice, turned things around. You know, these people do hold the balance of power. Quite often... They are voting and the government depends on their votes to get important legislation across the line. So I would argue they're actually some of the most important politicians to speak to on the program because ultimately they have to weigh everything up. They have to listen to all sides of politics and then decide which way they want to go. That's why we talk to people like Malcolm Roberts.